to welcome you on behalf of Sincere and Noble Projects, the two very interesting and very important projects in the limelight today. Dear guests, thank you for your interest and for being with us today. I am sure the experts who worked hard with their teams on the two projects are impatiently waiting for the opportunity to share with you very rapidly at least some of the findings and results of their work. Allow me just a couple of housekeeping rules so that we can work as efficiently as possible. Please do not hesitate to share your thoughts at whatever stage of the process. You are encouraged, warmly encouraged, to use the chat to raise any questions, submit your observations, comments, whatever you want to share, and to make this a common event. The objective of the event is to present selected conclusions and recommendations based on experiences, practical work and findings on the implementation of s related innovations and policy learning from two European wide research and innovation projects that are sincere and known. A brief reminder of the structure of our event or agenda of the day. We will start with a general presentation of the two projects continue with four presentations on the findings. Each presentation of 10 minutes will be followed by a short discussion of five minutes. We will then continue with the plenary discussion, 15 minutes, and then have a final wrap up. And now, finally, it is time to invite the experts to speak. Let me introduce Marco and Harald. Dr. Marco Lovric is a senior researcher at the Bioeconomy Program of the European Forest Institute. He is the coordinator of Sincere Project and has a background in forest policy and economics. His main topics of interest are European forest policy, forest ecosystem services, non-wood forest products, international trade of forest products and bioeconomy. Professor Harald Watzig is working on the development and application of decision support systems for multipurpose forest management. The development and application of criteria and indicators for evaluating sustainable forest management in a regional, national and international contexts is his interest. In conservation management, he is adopting population visibility risk or viability risk management approaches to evaluate conservation management strategies to identify courses of action to improve the viability of populations. He is also the coordinator of ERANET Project Noble, Noble Business Models to Sustainably Supply Forest Ecosystem Services. Marco and Harald, please take the floor. Thank you, Mira. Thank you for introducing me. And can I have the slide up, please? Thank you. So, sincere project. Well, people's demands towards forests are dynamic and they are evolving. And these demands are directed towards forest ecosystem services, and there are many of them. And they range from provision of wood, uh, carbon sequestration, biodiversity protection to different cultural and spiritual services. And in order that they are sustainably supp supplied and that this supply matches the demand, it's important to address uh, what synergies and trade-offs in the supply exist. And these might impact forest management practices and thus it's important to address what the responses of forest owners and managers are. And it's also to, important to address that the uh, sector operates in a very complex policy framework and that different approaches are needed on different levels and different parts of Europe. And all of this is a starting point for project activities which are that the project reviews and analyzes innovations relating to forest ecosystem services based on global experiences. It runs a learning architecture, basically co-design with stakeholders uh, of the 11 of the project case studies, and then it jointly implements these innovative mechanisms. Based on these experiences, we synthesize the knowledge across these innovation action case studies, and also figure out what can be upscaled from these uh, findings and what can be transferred to other areas. We have also worked on participatory way to uh, find a coordinated European policy framework for forest ecosystem services. And we have communicated and disseminated our knowledge for different methods. 
And uh, the presentations that you will see today are basically a synthesis of what the Sincere Project and the Noble Project have found. Thank you. And if you're interested more, please visit Sincere Forest EU. And now I give the floor to Harald. Thanks, Marco. Uh, also, uh, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, I would like to present now the general uh, overview about the Nobel project. Uh, uh, yes, you can change the slides now. It's great. Uh, the general objectives of the Project Nobel are, have been to assess the current and future role of marketable and non-marketable uh, forest ecosystem services and to develop strategies and mechanisms for the sustainable provision. And for that purpose, we have uh, evaluated a couple of methodologies for assessing the economic, social, and environmental values of forest products uh, and services. And we had the aim to evaluate different business models, mechanisms, and policies uh, to internalize the socioeconomic value of uh, forest ecosystem services. Uh, we have focused uh, in our project on case studies, on pilot demonstrations, and in these pilot demonstrations, we have been interested to identify the business relations between providers and, and consumers, design innovative forest management plans uh, in order to predict then the effects of forest management on the provision of forest ecosystem models and apply then these different uh, management concepts to the different pilot demonstrations. And the idea is that in these innovative uh, business models also to include a web-based auctioning platform, which allows them also to deduct trade-offs uh, among different forest ecosystem services in our pilot demonstrations. If you have more interest uh, on the Nobel projects and the ongoing work and publications, so you're also invited to have a look at the Nobel webpage and I'm looking forward now all the interesting talks uh, that are going to be held in the next couple of hours. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you very much, Harald, for these uh, introductions. I now have an opportunity to announce our first session, Governing Europe's Forest for Multiple Ecosystem Services, Opportunities, Challenges and Policy Options. Before I introduce the presenter, I would like to remind everyone that you can be active and interactive and to post questions in the chat as they appear. And now let me introduce Professor Georg Winkel as the presenter. Professor Georg Winkel is the chair of the Forest and Nature Conservation Policy Group at the Wageningen University and Research. He focuses on forest and conservation policy while the chaired group focuses on the political, social, economic and cultural dimensions of forest and nature. Professor Winkel aims to advance the understanding of major, major controversies related to forest and conservation policy worldwide, in addition to investigating human nature interactions at more local levels in different social ecological contexts. So Professor Winkel, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, um, Miro, and good morning from Wacheningen. Can you see my presentation and can you hear me? These are, can hear you. Can these are two perfect preconditions. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure for me to introduce joint work. Key points of our Sincere Nobel Policy paper. You see a huge list of authors um, next to my presentation that give you an idea how many people have been trying to put their wisdom together in the policy paper that I'm going to present. Um, now my computer wants to restart. I hope it still gives me 10 minutes to, <laughs> to do my presentation. To begin, what is the aim of the policy paper? We try to put together selected research findings from the Nobel project and the Sincere project, but also as you can see in the presentation from other projects, the Clearinghouse projects, also Horizon 2020, and with the InnoForce project together um, to um, look into the issue of forest ecosystem services in Europe, a bit from a governance perspective, and we are suggesting pathways for future European policies to support the provision of multiple forest ecosystem services. It is unavoidable that in this presentation, I have to be selective. We have a presentation of additional elements from the projects after my presentation, and also the paper, the full paper is available um, at Senodo 
you can see the link here and I will repeat this at the end of my presentation. The structure of the paper is as follows. <clears throat> We have identified three opportunities and six challenges. However, you may say more challenges than opportunities. If you take a closer look into the opportunities and challenges, there's elements of both in opportunities and challenges. And I will introduce them in a minute. And based on that, we have identified four main pathways, monitoring, policy, integration, payment for environmental services, and bottom-up participation. In what follows now, in the remaining eight minutes, I will give you some insights into the challenges and opportunities, and then introduce the pathways. Just to begin, um, the, the first challenge, and perhaps it's the major challenge uh, in, in our work on forest ecosystem services in Europe, is to align forest ec ecosystem services demand and supply. Here you can see data from the EU Horizon Project Clearinghouse, um, where a representative household survey was done in Europe with about 10,000 responses overall on preferences of society towards forest ecosystem services. In this figure, um, we have divided the responses with regard to urban and rural forests and have excluded other responses that were not specific towards spatially explicitly mentioned forests. What you can see, and I, we don't have time to go in details, is that ecosystem services such as air quality, aesthetics, human health, habitats for plants and animals, they scored very high on a scale from zero to 100 amongst the European population across all different countries. Why what we say, what we usually consider to be provisioning services, employment, fuel, wood, wood and hunting, they scored considerably lower in the perceptions of citizens that were asked in this survey towards forests. I've marked them here in red. I'm now presenting uh, the outcomes of another survey that was done um, together with the InnoForest project in the Sincia project. And here, um, thanks to the support of the European private forest owners and public forest owners, Eustophor CPF, we distributed a survey in different um, EU countries amongst forest owners and managers and asked them about inter alia, the relative importance of income from provisioning, meaning wood and other forest products, regulating, meaning aspects of climate change, mitigation and biodiversity provision, and cultural, meaning aspects of, for instance, recreational forest ecosystem services. We had a response rate of overall around 1,700, um, 1700 forest owners and managers. And here you can see um, distributed across Europe that we could analyze. And here you can see shortly some of the main, um, main findings on the relative importance of income from these different groups of ecosystem services. And in short, you can see that provisioning forest ecosystem services for nearly half of the forest enterprises are more than 80%, providing more than 80% of the overall income in forestry. There are um, also most important, there are and while on the other hand, and sorry, I have marked this not correctly here in this presentation, as you can probably see it, but on the other hand, regulating on cultural forest ecosystem services, keep in mind, these are the ecosystem services that were highly evaluated by society. They contribute for almost, for more than 80% of the forestry enterprises, only less than 20% of the overall income of the enterprises. There is, in other words, a challenge between societal demand towards forest ecosystem services on the one hand, and the opportunities for forest owners and managers to recreate income from um, ecosystem services on the other hand. There are further challenges that we identify in the joint policy paper. One is the political polarization in the EU and also many national debates relating to forests between let's say two poles of a more forest production by economy perspective and a more forest conservation biodiversity perspective, which is on one hand normal in policy making that there are different objectives, but it here inhibits partly the exploration of synergies because it is quite polarized recently. Secondly, also from the survey done in the since year together with the InnoForest project, we could see that the regulatory framework is seen by many on the ground forest managers and forest owners as an inhibiting factor for innovations with forest ecosystem services. It is very much um, the framework characterized by the long tradition of forestry uh, for wood production, and it makes it difficult 
to 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 try something else in forest management and to open up new markets for forest owners. There's also a lack of information on forest ecosystem service provision and specifically demand. So there's often, especially as at regional and, and national scales, a lack of knowledge on what actually society demands from forest and what they can provide. And there is fifth, climate change adaptation as a huge challenge that may, on the other hand, also open up new possibilities through adaptation to provide multiple ecosystem services. And finally, we should not forget in all these European scale talks that there is a striking diversity of forest situations in Europe um, that we also try to cover in the Sincere project with very different case studies, with very different environmental, but also socioeconomic settings across the continent. On the opportunity side, the diversity in society and changing societal demands are also reflected in diversifying objectives of forest managers and landowners. Um, there's some interesting niche market, for instance, in the Sincere project, we had the case of the funeral forest in Switzerland, where a new business model was developing with cultural forest ecosystem services for public and private forest owners that shows has shown a lot of um, growth on, on the market, if you want. And there might be future niche markets also specifically for regulating forest ecosystem services, thinking about carbon farming and plus the overall bioeconomy development. Now, concluding on the four pathways, pathway one, better information. A um, key message that came out, um, especially from the monitoring experts in our project is that you can't manage what you can't measure. Therefore, we recommend to develop a European monitoring approach towards forest ecosystem service, the entire spectrum of forest ecosystem services, where the idea would be to combine different available data sets and methods there's no need necessarily to reinvent the wheel, but to combine the available data and harmonize it if possible from remote sensing up to inventories, forest inventories, up to new ideas on participatory mapping to especially include also citizens and those that demand ecosystem service in an effective manner. This should, and I think this is an important message from the survey done <laughs> inter alia in the Cynthia, but also um, other projects uh, include also the demand perspective. There's a lot of modeling done, a lot of um, assessments done on the supply of forest ecosystem services, however, not harmonized necessarily. But what is often missing is really what is the societal demand. We measured that with perceptions in the Clearinghouse project, but there are of course also other ways to measure that, for instance, via marketing, via economics tool, where you look into the willingness to pay of um, citizens and consumers. And of course, um, we were always excited, especially our monitoring experts and colleagues about the possibilities to better provide better information on forest ecosystem service. There's also the need to find the right balance between cost and benefits, but also between harmonization across Europe and flexibility for the very diverse forest settings we have within the EU. And overall, this system should ensure that forest policymakers and managers have the information they need for decision making. Secondly, policy integration. Here the main idea is to coherently align EU forest policy objectives and policy instruments. And the idea is also to integrate targets, objectives, but also people. First, um, in our perspective, it is necessary to acknowledge the importance of different forest related objectives. Beyond the polarization we sometimes have in the policy debate, it is important to see that they're also regionally diverse, but also sectorally diverse different main ideas of what forestry and forest management is about. There's related to that, the necessity to increase what you may call the horizontal policy integration. We have now new and ambitious targets uh, under the Green Deal for forest, but there is an urgent need to link them, for instance, to financial instruments, keyword payment for environmental services. And there's also a need for transparency to understand synergies and goal and also conflicts between these different objectives. There's likely also a need to increase what you may say is vertical policy coordination across policy levels. Um, so uh, the EU level, national level, regional levels, and to also define processes of how you can develop regionally priority setting, because a lot of the forest ecosystem service related issues need to be in the end prioritized and discussed at regional levels. 
There's also a need for continuous science policy and practice dialogue, which we tried uh, a lot in Cincy and also Nobel, and stimulation of a public debate to tackle problems together and increase legitimacy of European forest ecosystem services related policies. The third pathway I will skip because you have a much uh, more in-depth presentation by Sven Wunder later in this webinar. I will directly turn towards the last pathway we identified, which we called bottom-up participation, enabling participation and encourage learning amongst forest ecosystem services innovators. One of the interesting um, key messages coming out of our project was that locally and regionally bottom up in trying to create in new ideas and innovations for forest ecosystem service and management strategy is a process worth doing in any case. On one hand, it is possible with such local participation process to raise awareness among stakeholders and to create a common understanding of management options and possible trade-offs. Secondly, it is possible to include different types of knowledge, but also different stakeholder preferences in such process. For instance, if you connect forest planning, forest management planning to, so to different societal perspectives in a participatory process. There's also the possibility to reach consensus or compromises because consensus is not always possible in forest issues as most of us anyhow know, but also to enable something that you may call as implementable forest management strategies for multiple forest ecosystem services. As I have said shortly, regulation, but also diverging views of policy stakeholders were seen as one of the most inhibiting factors by forest owners and managers in our survey for innovations with new forest ecosystem services to, to create mutual understanding, but also to create a common sense that this is a worse investment, for instance, to think about the water provisioning, to give a value to the water provisioning services of forest. This is important really to enable new business models, but also new policies to support this provision. And finally, I think something we learned in all of these EU projects is that facilitating exchange and learning across different local contexts, not only between the science and research teams that are anyhow collaborating very often, but also between the different local levels is very much has a lot of value and needs to be enhanced across the EU. With that, I thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, and I'm grateful to the funders of the Cynthia Nobel uh, projects and other related work I have been presenting, but I would also like to thank our many collaborating partners and the many forest owners, um, policy stakeholders and citizens that were willing to respond to our many questions in all the surveys and have made it possible to provide an overview as I've been trying to do. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Georg. Thank you for your presentation. We now have a couple of minutes for our discussion, um, and uh, I would like just to read a couple of questions from the chat and from the questions and answers. Uh, Hélène Koch is asking if there have been assessments of society demands versus society willingness to invest or pay for specific FES, and if so, what have been the results? I imagine this will be the discussed later. Uh, but Georg, feel free to take this question now or later in the discussion. And there is one uh, directed uh, to Georg specifically by Peter Löffler. Um, you mentioned that adaptation to climate change is a huge challenge, but also an opportunity for payments for FES. Could you please elaborate a bit more on that finding? Okay, thank you. On the first question, I would like to hand over to one of our economists here in the panel, perhaps to Borjelis McTorsen, because what I have presented and what we have been researching on was really public perceptions towards forest and how to translate it into willingness to pay. This is work where Bo and others have, or Sven, perhaps have been working a lot on, so I think they're better qualified to respond to that. For the second question, can you say this again? It was Peter Löffler asking about the possibilities. Yeah. Well, it's an, yeah. it's an interesting question, Peter, because I would think um, on one hand, um, we are increasingly in a crisis situation in forest management in Europe due to climate change. And there is a necessity to think about new adaptation, strat to think about adaptation strategies and to think about how will we also enable forestry in the future in Europe. And I think this gives two, th this has risks. On the one hand, it has really economic risks for forest enterprises. It is also risk that adaptation strategies are going very much 
towards a specific part of intensifying forestry, for instance, going for shorter rotation and, and really focusing on strategies to avoid risks by disturbances. It has huge opportunities on the other hand to, to learn from, from large scale disturbance, for instance, that have affected spruce plantations in parts of Europe heavily to diversify um, the tree portfolio, to diversify also the forest management strategies and to actively explore new markets for cultural and regulating ecosystem service. But I think you also mentioned, I can't find your written question, the keyword pass. I mean, it's also an opportunity to help now forest owners and forest enterprises to diversify by thinking about a European pass system, by helping to support this provision for diversity of ecosystem services for the future. So I think it has the aspect of a chance and it has the risk at the same time the situation we are in. But we are increasingly, I think, in an emergency there, this climate adaptation. I hope that was responding to your question. Thank you very much, Georg. Um, we have uh, several questions that go in the, into the same direction. Uh, and uh, I would uh, just suggest that we move on with the next presentation. And maybe in the meantime, Georg can also have a look at those questions that came in in the meantime. And to some of the questions, the following presenter will also provide an answer. So uh, our next session will be on payments for environmental services, possibilities of wider adoption in Europe. And uh, I would like to remind everyone again to post questions in the chat, which works really nice, and then introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Sven Wunder is a principal scientist uh, at the European Forest Institute. Its focus is on payments for environmental services and other incentives and business models for enhancing the provision of ecosystem services. Dr. Wunder ranks for the eighth consecutive year in Clarivate and Webs of Sciences yearly top 1% list, honoring the most highly cited researchers across different fields. Currently, Dr. Wunder's work and interests revolve around the broader fields of natural resource management, biodiversity conservation, livelihoods, fire resilient landscapes, as well as climate change mitigation and adaptation and the macroeconomic and forest effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So Dr. Wunder, please uh, be waiting for your presentation in patient. Thank you very much, uh, Miro, for this introduction and uh, good morning to everybody participating here. Uh, and my task today is, uh, uh, as Georg already foreshadowed, you know, uh, focusing on, on the particular pathway that would be uh, about payments for environmental services and perhaps uh, the discussions around whether there is a, a particular window uh, for uh, an, an EU-wide uh, pest system. Next, please. Um, just to, say, to, to uh, be clear about what I'm talking about uh, with the payments for environmental services or PES, you know, that it's voluntary transactions between users and providers of these services. And in particular, you know, that it's, uh, it's, it's a conditional transaction that uh, uh, you have some stipulations about natural resource management in a contract uh, that the, the, the land user, land owner has to uh, adhere to. Uh, and what you typically do is you pay for generating offsite services, uh, you bridge a, a spatial divide between the landowner and the consumer of these services. Now, this is a, like a model for, for how to, to, to remunerate uh, environmental services. And, and there, are, uh, there are other ways of generating income flows about environmental services. But in particular, Northworthy also, uh, we have this, this uh, public uh, PES system where uh, the state or the, the EU uh, is stepping in on behalf of the environmental service users uh, uh, to uh, assume their role uh, of paying for the services. Next, please. Uh, just to put it a bit in, in perspective about uh, land use, this is kind of the forest transition curve where we, uh, we have the typical development of uh, countries you can see over the very long term, you know, they start out with the, with the large forest cover 
which is then uh, being diminished as more land is being dedicated to, uh, to, to agriculture in particular. Uh, and then as these, these countries become uh, highly developed, uh, you typically see a U-curve, you see a, uh, that forest cover starts to, to again pick up. And that is uh, very much where the European uh, situation is. And uh, we can see it sort of moving uh, along the curve. What is it typically that, that these PES payments should do? Well, this, the yellow arrow uh, indicates that typically you want to have more forests actually uh, uh, as, as, as countries are deforesting, for instance, uh, you want for a given level of development or time uh, to keep them, to have them keep more forest that keeps uh, carbon stocks, biodiversity and other co-benefits. But I think when we move to this European scenario, things become much more difficult because uh, uh, what you want at this stage in terms of environmental services, it might be things like, like uh, uh, wildfire protection, or some recreational benefits that will mean sometimes also less uh, forests, less biomass, more managed forests, etc. It's a more complicated uh, uh, objective function that we are trying to to uh, uh, to attend to. Next, please. Um, if we look at what's what's out there in terms of experiences of uh, forest PES in in Europe, uh, there's obviously what, I, as I mentioned, some of these uh, windows for for payments around uh, the EU. It's rural development funds, in Natura 2000, etc. Several uh, uh, initiatives. In Scandinavia, you have some, some uh, important projects uh, about subsidizing forest management for, for biodiversity or, or for set -asides. In Central Europe, you have uh, payments for watershed uh, services and also for, uh, for landslide protection and, 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 and similar things. Uh, in Southern Europe, you have some experiences around protection of old growth forests, uh, about water quality issues in particular. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned, also fire protection, etc. Uh, and, and also some uh, reforestation or afforestation reforestation initiatives uh, that resemble the, the, the clean development mechanism. So overall, uh, various pilots uh, various pest-like initiatives that work a bit like, like old-fashioned subsidies, also some of them, uh, but a quite limited scale. There's not really been a, a breakthrough in terms of a larger scale adoption of forest PES in Europe. Next, please. So one of the tasks uh, that we did in, 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 in this project was is that kind of a global survey of, of PES initiatives of, and what works and what doesn't. And the, in one of the events, the, in, uh, the commission actually came back to us and asked, you know, what is a, uh, uh, what can you say about success conditions, preconditions for PES? And we disentangled that in a little bit and said, well, success would mean in the first place that that PS actually emerges, you know, as, as a system. And in the second place, that when it emerges, that it has the environmental impacts that we are looking for. So if we take the first part, the, the emergence, you know, what preconditions for, uh, for PES uh, uh, do we typically have to, to consider? Well, there has to be first uh, an economic argument for it in the terms of uh, the willingness to pay for these services actually exceeding the willingness to accept on behalf of land, land uh, holders uh, uh, to change something in, in, in management. So the, the opportunity costs needs to be uh, of the landowners need to be able to be bought out. And second, you know, there's some, uh, no, not yet. Uh, uh, so second, uh, there would be uh, some uh, uh, conditions on behalf of, uh, of the organization, institutional organization of, of buyers and sellers. They have to be able to actually get their act together to, 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 to make this work. 
And third, in particular in developing countries, uh, often there is, there's a, a lacking precondition in terms of, of land tenure being insecure, access rights not being safe, uh, uh, so that they don't really control fully the, the, the land uh, that they're sitting on uh, and therefore can't be reliable providers. That's not <clears throat> so much of a problem in Europe, uh, but in, in Europe, uh, uh, I think we can say that, and, and that was also a question coming up in the chat, that the private willingness to pay for these services uh, often has been somewhat limited by the fact that the state has assumed a predominant role in providing these services uh, through its uh, uh, role as a, as a regulator principally. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Thanks. Um, so in terms of then the, the impact side of, uh, of things, um, I think we do know something about, you know, what, are, what, are, what is the, the design necessary of these schemes uh, to, make them, uh, to make them work for the environment. For instance, spatially target those areas where uh, there's a, a high leverage in terms of providing more services, uh, in terms of threat, in terms of the density of the service being provided. Second, in the way you're paying, obviously, uh, often it's, it makes good sense to, to have different payment levels that are customized to the, to the landowners uh, to some extent. And third, you have to actually be serious about the, the conditionality part of it. Uh, uh, otherwise, the system will not be credible if you're not cutting the payments in, in cases of non-compliance. Uh, <clears throat> I think in Europe, the, the, the diversified payment part is, uh, uh, is pretty advanced, uh, uh, less so than the spatial targeting. That's something where, where Europe is not that advanced. And the third condition, the, uh, uh, how much conditionality there is, respected. We actually know very little about that in practice. Next, please. So turning now specifically to the to the pathway uh, that, that Georg mentioned, uh, you know, what arguments would there be for having an EU wide payment of payment of uh, uh, payments for environmental services? Uh, first, um, well, uh, there is the fact that that uh, 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 most of, uh, of the EU's forests are being used for, to produce wood, and also most of them are being accessible for recreation. And that's just is one example of a, a, the multifunctionality, de facto multifunctionality of forests, uh, which is difficult to, to manage if, you, if the unpaid part of it, the recreation, for instance, is not a, somehow being uh, economically taken into account by the landowner. Next. Um, we see more and more uh, uh, demands for taking the, the global environmental factors into account, in particular climate change uh, mitigation, but also biodiversity protection is in the EU uh, an increasingly important argument, uh, uh, but it's very hard to get people to privately pay for that. So, uh, because it is a, a, a highly collective a glo global good uh, and paying for it uh, through a, a, a centralized uh, state or EU-wide system uh, can help you deal with the, with the free rider problem that is so common to uh, environmental services. Next. Um, <clears throat> the fact that uh, especially biodiversity is, is, a, is a common argument uh, uh, means that you, you need to restrict use in some cases if you want to be serious about biodiversity protection. That means landowners will lose income and uh, they will only be willing to do that if they're being compensated for that. Uh, so this is an important argument for PES, we think. Next. Then there's also just the argument that you have a, 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 a large a, a system through the, through the CAP uh, a, of a subsidizing agriculture, a, which is really dominating of, a, also in terms of its impact on, uh, on farm incomes. Uh, and you maybe need, maybe you need a counterpart a, 
uh, from the environmental side, whether that is through fresh and new payments uh, uh, being dedicated to, 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 to forests, or it is uh, through a reform of the, of the, of the existing CAP payments to, to take even more into account some of the environmental and, and forest related aspects. Next, please. But we also <clears throat> have to realize that there are some important arguments against such a system that uh, we need to think about next. And, and a basic one is sort of the, that the legal uh, competence for, for, a, a, for forests lies very much more with the, with the uh, nation, national member states uh, than with the EU. So there's a legitimacy question, but also that the forest situation in, in different European countries is very different. So if you, when you set a baseline, over and above which you would provide payments, uh, those levels are gonna be very different probably in, in, in terms of a, uh, operationalizing such a system. Next. <clears throat> and of course, there are some uh, environmental services that are much more of, of a local scope. And uh, if we look at the global pest panorama, uh, what is most out there in terms of initiatives is on watershed protection. And that is typically a club good because it's, it's those who benefit from that are, are those who are in the, the club of users downstream uh, of a certain uh, watershed. Uh, and the recreational part is similar. Why should uh, all of EU citizens pay for those benefits that are very much localized? Uh, next, please. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of the financing, that's obviously a key question. Uh, uh, and if we're talking about sort of fresh resources, uh, we have to think about, you know, is this the right moment to, to ask for those types of investments when already a lot has been invested in terms of the uh, Green Deal, um, in terms of the, uh, the adjustment to the pandemics and, and, and now coming forward to us uh, uh, the dealing with uh, uh, the war situ situation in Europe. Uh, if we need to finance this through additional taxes uh, on the EU citizens, would they actually be willing to pay for that? Next. <clears throat> um, then there's also a question about the global efficiency of, of European uh, payments for environmental, for global environmental services. Uh, so uh, managing uh, uh, one hectare of forests in say in Central Europe differently uh, is maybe is, is clearly not as important as a, on a global scale as uh, making sure that one hectare of, of tropical forest keeps standing uh, with its uh, uh, carbon density and its uh, and its biodiversity uh, uh, benefits. Um, so that's something uh, to, to consider on efficiency on a larger scale. Next. <clears throat> and uh, some baseline issues, uh, just the fact that Europe's forest cover has really been uh, growing so much uh, over the last many decades uh, on abandoned agricultural land. And that refers to the, the forest transition curve that I was referring to earlier. Uh, uh, so isn't the forest panorama actually going very well? One could ask a bit provocatively, uh, why do we need to, to, to pay for that? Well, maybe we need to pay for it for, for different types of management and different composition, et cetera. Uh, uh, but there is uh, perhaps also fear that you know, some of those payments might be for things that might have happened anyhow. Uh, next, please. Uh, so my very last slide, you know, is about, you know, if we think, we say, what, uh, what if kind of uh, condition, if we went ahead with a, a system of this type, you know, what kind of principles would we need to think about uh, as a no regret action, so to say, next. Uh, first, we would definitely have to pre-agree on some of the systemic uh, objectives, you know, would you pay for forest? Would you pay for, for some landscape compositions? Uh, would it be a standalone forest thing or would it be integrated into a, 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 a reform of the, of the cap on a larger scale? Next. 
uh, the sources of finances should be should be clear. What comes from the EU? What comes from member states? Next, please. <clears throat> and I think, uh, I mean, specifically from our projects here, uh, we have some messages about uh, you know some some contracting mechanisms, innovative of innovative uh, type, uh, that are both both cost efficient for the environmental principle. And they are voluntary flexible for the landowners. Uh, so they, they are definitely a good idea, uh, but we need to actually uh, use them on, on, a, on a larger scale. And that requires also some courage on behalf of the, uh, of the uh, public environmental agencies uh, that have to make decisions on how to, to allocate resources. Next, please. <clears throat> um, I think what we see in, in many pest schemes, it's not that four or five different services pool their money together and, and each of them are, are equally well represented. Typically that doesn't work out. Typically there's a one service that comes to be the lead service and maybe biodiversity is, is, is the one service that is most legitimate in, the, in a European context as, as, as being in the lead. Um, so some consultative processes about the priorities of environmental services are, are clearly needed. Next. And the final point is a, uh, in terms of contracting a, a landowners and, and, and the time horizon of such a pest scheme. Um, the experience tells us a, a, that you have to adopt a sufficiently long-term uh, perspective on that. Uh, short-term contracts will not be uh, will not be able to actually provide those uh, environmental services, uh, and also not be satisfactory in terms of forest owners' forward uh, planning. So that seems to be an important lesson to to take into account. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sven, for your interesting presentation. Um, we have also received a great number of questions, comments, observations in the chat and in the Q&A box. I would perhaps just start with one thing, which is that the presentations and the recordings of the webinar will be posted on the uh, Sincere website, so we'll be able to have access to them later on. With regard to the questions that were specifically or are specifically addressed to Georg, we will have them answered later on in the plenary discussion. And uh, with regard to some other questions, uh, they will be addressed by the presenters, the two presenters that, that are coming now. I would just um, ask the one question to Sven as we are running behind the schedule. Uh, a question from David, and it, he says, David says, in which way can we speak of a new EU-wide PACE system? We have already RPP schemes for FAST payments, and these schemes have been underused. Don't you think that we should look at the reasons of this underuse? If Sven, if you would uh, reply yes. briefly, and then we would move, move to Professor Sotomayor, who wait. Um, definitely. I think that's definitely uh, uh, a very useful and pragmatic way of, of, of looking at it. Um, uh, and uh, I was just the other day, I was looking at, uh, at an analysis on uh, uh, you know on payments for uh, uh, wildfire mitigation analysis actually in Italy done in Italy, showing that uh, uh, you know that uh, the payments uh, done under the rural development funding uh, for those purposes had gone mainly to those areas where there actually was no real wildfire uh, danger. So so that's what I said about uh, spatial targeting. Uh, uh, where we think, I think we need to be more serious. We need to have more of a, uh, of a technical approach and less of a, a bureaucratic, uh, uh, of a bureaucratic uh, allocation of resources. Uh, we need to also make it easier in terms of the transaction costs involved to, to access uh, these, these funds. Uh, uh, but I think that is definitely a, a one action to take uh, in advance of of of, uh, of 
of, of developing a new system, it's to look at those mechanisms uh, that we have and why they have not been applied uh, at a sufficient scale. Thank you very much, Sven. There are other questions for you. Please have a look and then maybe prepare for the uh, plenary session. And we now move to our third presentation uh, that will be on auction games and forest management, collaboration and competition for payments, payments for ecosystem services. So I have a pleasure of introducing Professor Miguel Sotomayor. Uh, Professor Sotomayor works as an associate professor at the Faculty of Economics and Business Studies at the Catholic University of Portugal. His main research focuses on microeconomics and environmental economics, decision support models, and the analysis and evaluation of public policies. He was involved in the ecosystem services valuation and payments in the BioEcosys project and worked on the case study of the Nobel project in Portugal. Professor Sotomayor, the floor is yours. Please. Okay, good morning. Let me just first um, make sure you are seeing my presentation. Is that okay? Yes, it's working. Yes, we see it. It's okay. Is it working? So I just have to make sure. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'm here on behalf um, of myself and the other authors to make this presentation um, titled Auction and Forest Management Games. An intrig intriguing uh, title, I guess, but I hope my presentation will make it more clear in the end. Uh, this presentation is, uh, sorry, is split on um, in two, on two parts. First, a short introduction on the alternative use of auctions to fund non-market forest ecosystem services. And second, um, EcoCell, a tool in the development to support online auctions of non-market forest ecosystem services of a particular type is presented and discussed. Um, the figure on the right is a famous illustration of the basic idea behind payments for ecosystem services, it shows a market failure. The profit of, profitable decision is to convert from forest to pasture, but there are lots of negative externalities. We want to compensate the landowners' opportunity costs more for more socially uh, optimal management, but there are two big challenges. First, opportunity costs are heterogeneous and uh, usually unknown to policymakers. Second, money is scarce. The figure on the left is an example of designing a payment as a flat subsidy. Because costs are heterogeneous, we might overpay in a lot of cases. The red highlights differences between opportunity costs and the subsidy payment. These are inefficiencies. In a reverse auction, uh, you invite everybody to bid the lowest price they would need to be paid to do something. Then uh, you will take all their bids rank them from cheapest to most expensive, and then start signing contracts until you run out of money. This is a very simple example, but the idea is to design a game that landowners can win by revealing their um, an opportunity cost. But when we have good ecosystem models and optimization tools, we can also estimate opportunity costs this uh, colorful surface on the right shows trade-offs between three goals, profit, carbon storage, and having a forest with beautiful whole trees. Every point on the surface can be translated into a management plan. We can estimate the opportunity cost by traveling down the y-axis. That means we don't have to ask owners, what is the lowest price you are willing to accept? Like we did with a reverse auction. Instead, a forward auction asks stakeholders. What is the highest price you are willing to pay to see that forest manage how you want? Stakeholders cooperate by pulling their money to support their favorite plan. As you can see, some are more expensive than others, but they also compete because only one plan can be implemented because there is only one forest. So this is a strategy for addressing the second challenge I mentioned, 
it uh, it might help us raise money to manage forest papers. Coming now to the second part of my uh, presentation, uh, EcoCell is an online auction platform developed in USA in 2021. It was adopted and tested for the first time for European use. Um, the test carried out allowed some preliminary insights into the advantages and disadvantages of its use for European conditions. The EcoCell tests were carried out for a specific forest area, the Val do Souza Forest in Portugal, where the main non-market forest ecosystem services are for fire resistant, soil erosion protection, biodiversity and carbon stock. I want now to briefly explain the logic of EcoCell auctions. The objects up for auction are two or more bundle, bundles of non-market forest ecosystem services, mutually exclusive, is representing a shift by forest owners from their current market. Uh, forest management to one that leads to greater provision of non-market forest ecosystem services. Different bundles represent different preferences of different stakeholders for forest ecosystem service provision out of the case study forest. Each bundle has a specific reserve price corresponding to the forest owner's loss of market income to produce it. A bundle will be sold if it, its sum of bids reaches at least its reserve price, and none of the other bundles have a greater bid sum over its reserve price. The winning bundle will be converted into an enforceable 25 to 50 year contract between the winning bidders and the forest owners. An important part of EcoCell is it, its interface with participating bidders, which provides them with relevant information about what is for sale. With EcoCell, this information is provided through graphs and maps as shown in the upper left corner and on the right side. The graph is intended to show differences between bundles on the forest ecosystem service composition. The map shows what forest management, that is species composition and the geographic distribution in the forest area will be needed to provide each bundle. The table below gives bidders up-to-date information on the status of bids in order to allow a comparison at any time and for each bundle between respective reserve price and total sum of bids. The first EcoCell test was carried out with 10 forest case study stakeholders as bidders, with the auction taking place in a computer lab in order to allow an easy observation of participants' use of the platform and the main difficulties experienced experienced uh, by them. Four forest ecosystems bundles were auctioned, um, previously selected by researchers and each, each uh, corresponding to the optimization of one of the four non-market forest ecosystem services considered for the forest case study. Bidders were given a maximum budget, budget to spend and the real bundles reserve price were rescaled to match aggregate bidders budget. After one hour, the auction was closed with the bundle sold as depicted on the chart, also available to bidders any time along the auction. The second EcoCell test uh, was carried out with 18 forest case study stakeholders, and this time the auction took place online to make the auction more realistic, but the groups of participants were invited to join a Zoom meeting along the auction, again to allow observation. Three bundles of forest ecosystem services were auctioned this time, previously selected as preferred by three different groups of the forest case study stakeholders, environmentalists, recreational forest users, and residents. Participant bidders were also given a maximum budget to spend and the real bundles reserve price were rescaled to match aggregate bidders budget. After one hour, the auction was closed without any bundles sold as depicted on the chart, also where to bidders any time along the auction. As all bundles aggregate bids were too short for the reserve prices. To conclude, I now present the main preliminary insights that EcoCell tests allowed us to address so far. First, most participants, after a first monitor mock auction, declared that they had no difficulties in using the platform, considering it a user friendly device. Second, it was observed that not all information provided to bidders on the nature of the different bundles and the associated forest management plans was equally influential to bidding decisions with the shortest summarized descriptions apparently the most influential. 
third bidder's comments on the announced deadline for forest ecosystem system bundles to be delivered suggest that the longer the bundles contract time, the less willing bidders will be to pay other things being equal. Fourth, success of auctions relies on the existence uh, uh, of aggregate demand, at least matching the lowest reserve price on offer, which might not be the case for a particular forest estate. Fifth, the setting of the reserve prices, the scale of which is crucial for the success of this type of auction, must be realistic and never overvalued. For instance, for the Valsuosa case study, a, la a large forest area of more than uh, 3,500 hectares with no outstanding conservation value and relatively little little resident population around, this might clearly be a problem. Now to end up, I just suggest you some for the readings in case you want to know more. First two papers uh, uh, we are working on, on and novel discussing these topics of using auctions for non-market forest ecosystem services funding in more detail. <clears throat> and then three papers more giving a detailed discussion on the ecosystem type auction rationale and on the optimization tool preceding those options. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. I'm most very grateful for your presentation and also for having kept in time, uh, which gives us the ability to look at certain uh, questions that appeared in the chat, uh, starting with uh, the one from Detlef. Um, he says that it is unclear to non Sorry, non, unclear to non-participants who is offering supply and who is on the demand side. What are the roles? As this is a lab exper is this a lab experiment uh, so far? So, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the the setting, the organization um, of this auction? Okay, concerning who, who are the who are the suppliers and who, uh, who are the, the the buyers? So, the suppliers are uh, the forest owners in, in, in our case study, not exactly one forest owner, but um, um, an association of forest owners um, delegating the management of, of their forest to a um, um, uh, forest owners association. So these are the ones that will uh, are buying, are selling um, a, a bundle of ecosystem services different from what they are doing currently. And the buyers are the, or the bidders in the auction are all the forest stakeholders. Um, any interest in, in the, um, uh, uh, having a stake on that forest. And in our case, we, we identify um, at least three major groups, um, people with uh, keen on, on environmental issues, uh, we call the environmentalists, and um, also, recreational users of that forest and and also residents people people living um, uh, nearby the the forest um, we we um, from uh, we, we conclude um, um, we uh, from um, answers to a questionnaire and interviews that they do have different preferences for forest ecosystem services so that's why we um, uh, include them in, in, in the mock auctions. And uh, that's why we also identify for each group different um, optimal bundles to be uh, uh, sold in, in the auction. And this was the first question, was it? Um, what was the second one? Miro, can you help me on that? Because... Yes, the second one uh, came from uh, Mrs. Marion Carman, as, as much as I can see. And she's thanking you for your clear presentation. And she's also asking you if uh, she could please have the info about the recommended readings again. Uh, that is to say the links to the literature uh, as everything went too quickly. Yeah. So, okay, uh, shall I, no, I can, maybe I can add uh, uh, using the chat, the list. Is that yeah. okay? Uh, you can do that now uh, in the chat, or we can also come back to this later and put it on the website of Sincere. Okay, so 
just not to, to disturb the, the, the questioning time. I, I, when it finished, I, I'll have to the chat the, the, the full list of five articles. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we now move to our fourth and final presentation uh, that will be on uh, upscaling potential and innovative business models for forest ecosystem services. And I would like to introduce Professor Bo Jelesmark Torsen. Uh, Professor Jelesmark Torsen is the head of department and professor of applied economics at the Department of Food and Resource Economics and affiliated with the Center for Macroecology, Evolution and Climate. He has a PhD in the field of forest and natural resources economics. His research interests are decision making under uncertainty, environmental valuation methods, regulation of and use of natural resources. Uh, Professor Yeles Martorsen will also address some of the questions that were, that were put in the chat. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. you know. Um, I will just make sure this goes into the right mode. And please not if you see the right mode, Miro. Thank you. So I'm going to present today uh, an overview of some of the lessons learned from the Sincere project uh, that I have been uh, working on together with uh, the uh, three co-authors here um, mentioned, uh, but in particular also the many uh, partners involved in Sincere in the innovation action cases. Uh, so thank you to them already in advance here. So I'm going to start a little bit uh, basic on some uh, some theory and frameworks that um, that I have um, uh, used that we have used in in our approach here. So the first is the theory of change perspective uh, that we adopted a little bit modified from some of Swen's earlier work and colleagues. Uh, and uh, and I want to just highlight the briefly the steps around the wheel here. So basically we start by assuming in many ways that there are some basic inputs that are present. We have the resource needs and that includes, and let's be clear about this here because we're gonna see that be a, a problem that user finance, uh, the finance is in place. And uh, we know about the contextual uh, knowledge. We have insights into the uh, ecological uh, and, and socioeconomic knowledge that we need to make um, uh, to, uh, to to make our 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 uh, change uh, management here uh, work right. So then uh, the second part we do is usually what we may relate to as uh, the instrument we apply to uh, induce a change. So that is called here in this uh, theory of change perspective a treatment. So this could be a contract, an agreement, a donation instrument, uh, uh, something that we uh, introduce to. Uh, induce a change that can uh, enhance the provision of ecosystem services. And if that is successful, to some degree at least, we should expect some key outputs related to uh, uh, the, the provision of these instruments, like uh, we get contracts signed by uh, pest providers uh, uh, and maybe even between pest providers and payers. Uh, and all the agents involved uh, are clear about the rules and understand the uh, and accept the treatment or the concept that they are working under. Provided that happens, then we should see um, uh, improvements in outcomes on the ground in, and that will have everything from livelihood effects. People in the chat have been talking about jobs, but it's also incomes and also, of course, the effects of receiving the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the better protection of the environment, uh, the ecosystem services which in turn uh, uh, re results in the welfare improvement that we want, are looking for from an economist's point of view here. Uh, and that, and that's the development of the, of we can say the presentation of this that we made in this delivery is that we concluded the circle because basically the financing and the legal uh, framework around the ecosystem services often reflects uh, upon the welfare potentials that can be uh, achieved from enhancing uh, the ecosystem services. So that feeds back into the circle, so to say. So that just briefly introducing the theory of change perspective that we have used. I'm gonna introduce now also just some more basic theory that I suspect many of you have been taught at a point, but maybe also many of you, I think we have 
150 or more participants here. So this could be news, but it's important basic facts about uh, goods. So in this table, which is uh, taken from Ostrom 2003, but actually built on much older theories, uh, we look at goods according to two axes. So the vertical axis here is about being able to exclude people from enjoying a good or a service. If a landowner can exclude, uh, exclusion is feasible, that has implications for how a good will be supplied or can be supplied and rewarded. If it's infeasible to exclude people from using or consuming or benefiting from a service, that has other implications. Uh, subtractability relates to, it's, some, it's also sometimes called rivalry, and it relates to whether or not uh, one person's consumption uh, detracts from other person's ability to consume it. So uh, if I eat the cake, you can't eat the cake, is the clear case. Here I'll use a, a, a small example. So in Denmark, uh, horseback riding is allowed in public forests. And if there are not uh, many horses around or other uses of the rec recreational goods, then that essentially is a public good in the way that exclusion is not allowed and therefore infeasible. But it's also non subtractable in the way that one person riding the horse in the forest does not harm the quality of the experience of the next person riding the horse in the forest. If there are enough horses and mountain bikers and hunters and runners, we might see that the recreational experience, the quality of the recreational experience becomes more of a common pool resource. There's some competition for speed, for space, for quiet, for for the quality of the experience. In Denmark, riding your horse on roads in private forests are not allowed. And that's why we have a market for horseback riding where horseback riders pay sometimes several thousand Danish crowns a year to have a license plate on your horse that gives you the right to ride in a, a private, uh, in a private forest where you've paid for that license. So that this here we see because the forest owner can exclude these hunt, these uh, riders from their forest, and uh, uh, and that is enough to be able to create actually a market for a forest ecosystem service. So regulation and the nature of the good matters, and we will see examples of that in the sincere case too. So biodiversity protection and carbon sequestration is something we all benefit from when it happens or suffers from when it doesn't happen. So these are public goods. We cannot be excluded from it uh, uh, for benefiting and the non-subtractable. So these are really hard to build a market on. When we see examples of markets like carbon credits that were also brought up in the chat here, we are actually seeing a different kind of goods. So a carbon credit that can count against, for instance, a, ta a firm's uh, carbon taxes or somehow be of value to the CSR uh, management. It's actually a different good that we're selling. We will still be able to enjoy the carbon sequestration if that carbon credit increases carbon sequestration without paying for it. What the company buys is a different product actually. And the same goes for biodiversity offset values that exist in some uh, places in the EU also, that they're actually buying a different product. We as citizens will still enjoy or be harmed by any uh, effects on the biodiversity protection from that instrument, the biodiversity offset instrument. So now I'll turn to the cases that we have in Sincere. We have five groupings of the cases and I'll briefly try to quickly outline uh, uh, them. So two of the cases uh, actually targeted some of the inputs part of the theory of change framework, namely how can we change the natural local regulatory frameworks so we can enhance incentives for forest ecosystem service provision. So this is the Russian case that tried to improve the current lease practices in, uh, in Russia that would allow for better coordination across uh, ecosystem service users through being able to trade and lease bundles of ecosystem services rather than individual services. As currently the case, the Russian uh, uh, case also tried to argue for changes in the forest law that would actually allow actual payments for these uh, for forest ecosystem services. Uh, so the a related case is the Basque uh, case in Sincere that also have worked for in, uh, enhancing uh, the role or the potential for payment for ecosystem services in local regulations. Uh, 
uh, and also a small pilot, and this is forthcoming in the best case. So basically, this kind of cases are trying to improve uh, the framework for provision of forest ecosystems through targeting uh, the regulatory framework. And that's a basic instrument already pointed out by Musgrave about uh, enhancing regulation to improving uh, the benefits of uh, derived from externalities. So at a generic and conceptual level, these actions, of course, can be upscaled in the sense that addressing deficiencies in regulation as a fundament for a, a change in provision is, uh, is always a valid, uh, a valid point or a valid goal to pursue. But of course, they are hugely context specific. Now I turn to uh, the reverse action, actually a reverse of what uh, Miguel just uh, uh, presented. In two cases in Sincere, uh, the Danish and one of the Belgian cases uh, targeted improved biodiversity conservation measures. Uh, that is, they actually targeted the provision of a pure public good. They specifically tried to apply reverse actions to exploit forest owner heterogeneity, both in cost, heterogeneity cost, but also heterogeneity in what kind of goods, what kind of quality of biodiversity um, the protection could be uh, delivered by the forest owners, asking forest owners to come up with both uh, actions, suggestions for actions and cost, uh, that is the price they wanted. So it should be said immediately that these, uh, because of the design of Sincere and, and some national circumstances, both of these experiments had access to the funding they needed so the financing was in place, limited financing, but still enough to a real world realistic experiment. And for public goods, this cannot uh, in general be relied on. It's not reliable through the markets because of the free riding that we know is the presence when, uh, when, when uh, we're talking about public goods as also Sven has highlighted. So these instruments actually secured, were quite successful in securing the potential for improving the provision of ecosystem services because actual contracts were signed on actual hectares of forest, like the ones uh, on the picture here, where potential for biodiversity values uh, and, and increased uh, and biodiversity values were in place. So these contracts are now signed, uh, written into uh, legal deeds uh, and binding uh, essentially forever on these lands. That's a direct clear impact of Sincere in demonstrating uh, an instrument on the ground. And they were also actually quite successful, it seems at least in, in the case of Nobest, of course, the Danish case, in taking advantage of the heterogeneity of forest owners. It seems like our cost is maybe between 30 and 50% cheaper per hectare than corresponding flat rate uh, uh, existing schemes in Denmark because of the competition element uh, in, the, in the instrument. So this design and the ideas, of course, can be upscaled in many ways, providing funding is available. Uh, and again, we need an instrument to secure this funding. Donation could be one instrument. I'll talk about that next. Because we also had two sincere cases that proposed and implemented into, uh, uh, and targeted the a provision of recreational services, uh, recreational services that were essentially public goods because of the context where the recreation uh, service was delivered. And they tried different uh, uh, forms of donation instruments and requests. And in both cases, uh, they did secure some funding, but, uh, but it was also, it proved quite difficult that coercing donations, voluntary donations, based on, should we say, mild persuasion and nudging is quite difficult. Uh, uh, and they're not unexpected due to the free riding element. And again, turning back to a theory of change framework. So again, these instruments are trying to address like the regulatory uh, instruments we saw from Russia and, and the Basque countries are trying to address some fundamental assumptions in our theory of change, basically that funding is available. When that is not the case, it's of course relevant to address this. Uh, but donation has proved difficult to uh, to make work to a reasonable attempt, uh, reasonable degree. Uh, and as such, of course, you can upscale. You can uh, try this approach in many ways. For instance, in the more advanced approach, 
that uh, Miguel just um, outlined in the in, in the forward auctions, uh, but it will have the same inherent shortcomings. They will remain, and generally we would theoretically and empirically expect that we are unlikely to reach the funding scale needed to finance optimal, socially optimal operation levels. We need coercive instruments for public goods. Then we have two other categories where we are actually seeing payments made. So the first one is on-site user fees, paying for ecosystem services, three sincere actions, designed instruments that aim to extract actual payments from on-site users. You're quite straightforward. Georg already touched upon one of them, but the simplest case actually was the Italian case who basically had a case where focusing on enhanced marketability of an already marketed good, the licenses to pick mushrooms in specific forest areas. And that case, of course, had a good business case and a good uh, effect uh, on, on, on its, uh, on its uh, target. And second, the Swiss case uh, uh, selling, selling burial rites in the forest, funeral forest that Georg uh, uh, also introduced, also delivered and uh, entering and structuring a market and and providing actual goods um, and services to people for actual payments. The creation case uh, had, uh, apart from the donation experiments, also a targeted payment for group-based and organized recreational activities in the national park. They were undertaking the experiment in that actually also worked and created actual payments from actual users towards uh, providing uh, and securing the quality of the recreational infrastructure and the uh, quality in the national park. So of course, all these uh, are examples that show that if you have the right delineation of rights of access, exactly like the horseback riding examples I introduced first showed, then if you can exclude and, uh, 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 and, and there's some degree of control, then you will uh, be able to enable market-based solutions. So these instruments are of course scalable to any context where this is the case. And in fact, many of these already exist across the, the European Union forests. The final group relates to off-site user payment, uh, payments. So these are cases where the payments towards the ecosystem service provision comes from beneficiaries that benefit from the service, but might not live close to, uh, uh, and may in fact be quite far away from the forest. So the problem here uh, is a classic pace Pest cases that a forest owner might not be able to deny non-paying downstream users access to the benefit, but they can affect the benefit through their management. And that creates the incentives on, on both sides to engage in, uh, in transactions. So we had two cases, the Peruvian case and a Catalonian case that were basically more or less classical watershed uh, payment by existing services schemes. We target a common water coordination problem between upstream and downstream uh, providers and users, uh, and, and were uh, able to set up uh, structures that could uh, enable contact and at least some uh, degree of, uh, of uh, payment uh, structures uh, in their cases. We actually also had a third case that are quite different in a way, in uh, Italy, um, there's an Italian popular forestation case in, uh, in, in Sincere relied on actually requirements for FSC certification of the poplar wood from the poplar plantations. To be able to meet the uh, certification criteria, these poplar growers needed to document sufficient uh, biodiversity protection requirements. And that would either be infeasible or expensive on their own lands. So the uh, Italian case here set up a scheme where the FSC accepted poplars to buy uh, and pay for protection in a natural park so that the enhanced biodiversity protection came through a kind of offset, not directly an offset, an additional set, if we can say that. Uh, so they provided this, this uh, instrument for poplar growers to pay for it in order to uh, uh, gain an FSC certificate. So that is also a, an example of, in a way, an offsite user payment. The popular, the popular grower benefit from offsite protection uh, of biodiversity conservation by being able to acquire an FSC certification of his popular land. Again, these type of mechanisms can be scaled to cases with similar relationships between ecosystem service providers and users. 
establishment institutional setup for aggregating user payments is often the crucial part, as, as you will uh, see if you dive into our report on this. One final slide is basically three concluding remarks. So looking at these cases, we can see that the distribution of rights, including in particular rights of exclusion, is crucially important for the development of any market-based activities for the consumers of users of forest, uh, or users of forest ecosystem services. So this is the driver, I think, because the subjectability aspect has much more to do with the nature of the good. Then coordination for cost effectiveness is a crucial aspect. And we have learned here that it's, it's, it's possible to increase coordination of market in using market-based instruments for allocating efforts to suppliers, both exploiting uh, heterogeneity in quality aspects and in uh, cost aspects. And then a fundamental fact that also played into sincere funding public good provision is a core channel challenge for forest ecosystem services because in particular two of our forest ecosystem services, carbon chains and biodiversity carbon Carbon uh, sequestration and biodiversity protections are pure public goods, uh, and uh, and we need uh, governance structures that handle that part to be able to have a socially optimal uh, provision of that. So finally, uh, the core challenge uh, uh, remains uh, to uh, to uh, to secure and accrue the funding for these uh, public goods. So public tax-based funding remains at the core for these goods. Thank you. And again, a huge thank you to all the IE partners that made this work possible. Thank you very much, Bo, for your presentation. Um, there is, um, the chat is full, the question and answers are full, uh, and we are now in the almost, uh, as to every presenter, I, I would also like to present one of the questions uh, to, to Bo. Um, which is perhaps the last one, why not have a stock exchange approach for a homogeneous good as both the sellers and buyers are fragmented? And uh, if you want, you can reply immediately or later on during the, the, the questions and answers plenary session. Yeah. I would, yeah. would so like I, to do it now. Yeah, I can, I could just, so you can do that for, for hmm, you could do that for, uh, for some services and goods. Uh, if you have enough user goods where I suppose you have a, a kind of a, say a quota of forest users, for instance, horseback riders or hunters, actually hunting might be a case where this is already in, in, in example in place. So you can do it for marketable goods uh, where people are buying in and paying and competing for, pi for, for buying in to uh, an actual private good or club good that they would benefit from themselves. Uh, so then I think you could make that function. In a way, the forward auction uh, donation structure that uh, Miguel, uh, uh, if I understood that correctly, uh, uh, presented could also be seen as a, such a case, but you have fundamentally the issue, I think that this is a donation issue and not a competition issue. People are not competing for the good. You're benefiting from the good anyway, all of them. So free riding remains a challenge. We do have a lot of donation instruments in place already for forest ecosystem services across Europe, if we look closely. Uh, and they do not work with the competition element that you find in stock exchanges. Thank you very much for this uh, intervention. Now we have just a couple of minutes left uh, uh, and Miguel has to leave because he has other appointments. Uh, thank you very much, Miguel, for being with us today. Maybe uh, let's just start with one question that was in the chat. Thank you very much to all those who already replied and interacted with other participants. That was really helpful. Uh, so we can now just concentrate on a couple of questions in the time that's still uh, available. Kelsey Perelman asks um, or says, uh, common agricultural policy funds did not provide strong enough conditionality to achieve biodiversity outcomes, according to the EU Court of Auditors, and focusing narrowly on objectives like carbon sequestration can lead to perverse outcomes. 
What do panelists think of financing activities, agroforestry, close to nature forestry, non-intervention, as opposed to outcomes like carbon uptake? Who would like to start with uh, thoughts on the Kelsey's uh, observation? We are all he thinking heavily still, I see. Should I? I can start talking, then the other can continue thinking. <laughs> so I, I think Georg will also. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the, uh, the crucial thing is here is what would we be paying for, right? So why would we pay for continuous cover forestry? We need a good argument for that. In Denmark, the for instance, in many parts of Europe, I think there's a good argument for for continuing cover forestry already from a basically simply profit maximizing argument. Uh, in those cases, we should not pay for that uh, additional. There's no additionality to be gained. Uh, so I think the first question to ask there basically is what what is the ecosystem services that we stand to gain from supporting this? And will payments be needed to gain them? Over to you, Georg. Yeah, thank you. You gave me a few seconds more. I mean, that's a very complex question because on one hand, it's looking back into the CAP experience. I recall several years ago, we worked uh, on that issue for Natura 2000 payments. And there was also a comment by Gerhard Weiss in the chat that indeed there was a situation that there was in theory much more money available, but then it was not taken up also especially by the forest rich countries, which indicates that there was some reluctance um, to basically use the payment for biodiversity uh, under the cap. So that um, that's of course something that's then, um, well, that's a challenge because um, how can you then, you have a situation where you have um, a directive that expects you to to work for habitats, to, in, to, to protect habitats at the same time, the money part of it under the cap, it's not working because there's some reluctance to fund these measures, at least in forestry. So that is a challenge. And then about what to pay for, I would frankly say there are different strategies of how you could prioritize. You could look at, let's say, high conservation value forests or forests that are of specific importance uh, under a certain ecosystem service perspective. You could look for measures that have a lot of promise in bundling different ecosystem services. I hope that is the correct term from an economist language that you basically perhaps close to nature forest management could be such a measure that um, that has a potential to be good for both for um, uh, climate mitigation on one hand and biodiversity issues on the other hand. Again, it will depend a lot on what you mean with closer to nature forestry and so on. And of course, you could also say that um, you give a priority now to areas where there is a very high demand coming from the society on land that's perhaps privately owned. And you have a lot of, let's say, underlying conflicts with the forest owners' objectives in that region vis-a-vis -vis the societal demand. So there is a need to prioritize. I'm not sure if this can all be done at an aggregated level or if it needs to be done really at a, at a regional level. And I think in general, um, pragmatically, I would strive for, for the measures where you have the highest possible gains and the highest potential for the synergies. Um, but then again, there was also this in your in your in your question, I believe if we should pay for measures vis-a-vis -vis objectives, and I guess um, this is a question perhaps uh, for Mr. Wunder if he's still there because we discussed this recently, and I think you can go for a bit of a pragmatic approach there. Sven, are you still there? I'm there, but my video is blocked, uh, so <laughs> I can speak uh, still. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's. Uh, often you don't you don't pay actually for the services delivered because you it's difficult also to measure you know that you're delivering a service for instance in terms of watershed protection or the, uh, the outcomes may be you know many years down the road uh, only uh, clearly uh, measurable so you you pay for for some kind of proxy of of land use, so so in that sense, I'm uh, I'm very much on board with the the suggestion of the of the, the of the in the chat that it's it's maybe you know some kind of a land use uh, uh, some proxy that 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 you have to target. You just have to have very clear you know what is the connection between that uh, that proxy and and the eventual uh, service that is supposed to be delivered, uh, and and I would think that. Important is it 
to make sure you're not paying for, as, as Bo also said, you're not paying for something that would have happened anyhow. So you deliver a uh, uh, sort of hot air down the road uh, uh, because then it becomes more of a rent seeking exercise. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have another question that is also related uh, or addressed to all the panelists. Um, Franz is asking if there are examples of sorts of payments citizens can do, how to organize that, especially structurally. Who would like to start with uh, this general question? I can, I can talk again while others think. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there are good examples, as I said, also of structured donation instruments uh, set up. And we all, I mean, how many hand raised if you're a member of the WWF Greenpeace or something like that, uh, or have uh, given donations to their programs. So there are a lot of inst uh, institutionalized donation structures in place uh, all across our countries where uh, uh, the state uh, institutions, semi-state institutions, uh, governmental organizations, or even private landowners set up donation instruments with them to get, uh, to acquire funding for supporting uh, the provision of, uh, of ecosystem services. So it's not that you can't get donations. The problem is that you can't get enough donations. That's problem number one because of the free riding aspect. And the second issue is that in many of these cases, it can be hard to see additionality. You are donating, you and you you'll get the you'll get the what's called the diploma for donating, uh, and uh, and uh, and that's maybe what why you are buying it, why you're donating. But but the evidence that actually you're providing new things are sometimes in some of these donation schemes not present. In others, they are actually quite present depending on the, depending on the schemes. So, so yeah, it, it does work in the, in the sense that you do get to do donations. You all know about giving a goat in a, as a Christmas present, right? Or some or similar donations, it's that kind of things. There is one question that goes in the in the direction of all the panelists as well, which is by Jeroen, uh, and he's asking that regarding opportunity costs, how does this match on a policy level with principles such as polluter pays? And this would be our last question to react to. I don't see any volunteer who would be willing to, to take that question, but maybe we could leave it for some other time. Um, also with regard to the other questions that are left unanswered, I'm sorry to, to, to say it, but we were not able to discuss them all and we need to wrap up uh, our session of today. Uh, we have um, a colleague of ours who has this uh, difficult task to summarize everything that has been said. And that colleague is Professor Tobias Plininger, whom I introduce now. Uh, professor Tobias Plininger is a professor of social ecological interactions in agricultural systems at the University of Göttingen and the University of Kassel, and currently Vice Dean of Research at the University of Kassel. He is a sustainability scientist with a commitment to inter and transdisciplinary research at the social ecological interface. In particular, he studies rural landscape change, ecosystem services, and sustainability transformations. So, Professor Plininger, uh, please, for the wrap up. Thank you so much, Miro. That's indeed a challenge to synthesize an event that is already a highly condensed synthesis um, of not only one, but two uh, plus several uh, other projects. Um, but um, I will try my uh, best. Uh, maybe let me start by remarking that, uh, yeah, forestry on the one hand, if you like, uh, could be seen as the inventors of ecosystem services thinking. Um, 
there have been long-standing debates. We also have published about that some years ago. Uh, there was a German forestry professor, Victor Dieterich, for example, who published already in the early 1950s a framework on forest functions, which is not so different uh, in the end from what we nowadays call the position theory. But having said that, I feel that uh, forestry or the forest sector is relative is coming relatively late to the table of the current debates on ecosystem services and other fields have been much more proactive than that. By that, I'm happy that finally there are so many um, projects engaged in this topic, like Sincere and um, Nobel. Um, and it's really high time. Georg outlined in the first presentation a little bit uh, the environment, the challenges that are large. Obviously, the whole future of, of European forests is really at stake um, somehow. But I would take up many of these points also positively. You don't hear me very well. Thank you. If that is getting better, yeah, my micro had somehow switched off. Sorry for that. Um, and now I now I lost my point. Yeah, about I would say, despite the multiple challenges and pressures, there are also many opportunities. Right, that obviously the importance, um, the societal importance uh, ascribed to forests is increasing strongly. There are discussions not only in our circles about providing finance for forests. There are new actors, new activities, new innovative models for supporting forestry, as we heard in this event. So there are also great chances. I think Sven, in his presentation, gave some very important definitions, just to make sure that um, payment schemes for ecosystem services are well defined. Uh, just and PES is not just another subsidy, but it has to be bound to certain principles. For example, yeah, additionality. If um, we introduce new payments, then society or those who pay want to see some additional benefit that goes beyond what is being done already, and that's not a trivial trivial task to implement that. Also, permanence. These services, the provision needs to be guaranteed uh, over long time scales. So that is all all not easy. And I think um, in these projects, and uh, thanks to the work of Sven, we we also learned that uh, Europe is not necessarily uh, necessarily a leader in this field, and that there are other continents like South America, for example, where there are valuable experiences that we should uh, learn from. Although that's maybe an uh, order of learning that we are learning from other uh, continents that we may not be uh, so much used uh, to, so to say. I found this discussion interesting about creating a counterpart to the common agricultural policy. On the one hand, it's often difficult to understand why we are funding our farmers with billions of euros every year and uh, though, uh, fund foresters with much, much less um, money. On the other hand, I would be careful, is my personal opinion. The cap is very far away from a, a model payment scheme for ecosystem services. I would say uh, it's almost impossible to get uh, this big uh, funding scheme reformed. Um, so um, a clear definition of principles will be important. And my point as someone now being more active in the field of agricultural science is that there is a lot of learning. There are many experiences uh, especially after 30 years of agro-environmental schemes and in uh, the forestry sectors, we would be wise of taking up uh, some of these experiences of how to organize payment schemes at landscape scale, how to introduce collaborative themes, how to get spatial targeting um, done on the ground, how to invent outcome-based um, payment schemes and so on. Uh, with Miguel, well, we learned a little bit about the pleasures, about the potential of a specific type of payment scheme, the auctioning, forward reverse auctions, but also about the complexities, right? How to, yeah, long-term contracts, for example, obviously are a necessity for the provision of many ecosystem services and biodiversity, but that imposes many restrictions that makes it easily less attractive for forest owners to participate, spatial targeting, aggregating demand, and so on was another um, challenge that uh, Miguel mentioned. By that, my uh, learning point was that, well, these schemes can be an important um, complement, but obviously will not be able to restrict, uh, to replace um, legislation that is already around um, uh, biodiversity conservation, such as Natura 2000. Finally, from Bo, a very 
deep, very rich uh, insights, very condensed also. So I'm struggling maybe most with condensing um, this presentation. I think Bo, what, what you presented is a very useful kind of classification of the different uh, types of tools, of mechanisms that are around. Obviously, um, the situation of European forests, the local context, the type of demand, the expectations of society is very diverse and it will be very difficult um, to find the one size fits all um, instrument. So my take home point perhaps would also be that on the one hand, there is a task for the European Union to fund maybe some basic safeguarding of the most important ecosystem services, those that matter for all uh, European forests, those, those that have public good um, character, but at the same time, maybe the innovative mechanisms that we collected in these projects have more the function of a toolbox um, where we show the potential that they have, but then depending on the local or regional context, um, some of these tools fit and others uh, are not so appropriate. I'm ending just with two, maybe a little bit self-critical remarks about this event. Obviously, we have a certain or a focus, you could also say bias on economics in our presentations, that's somehow self-evident when we talk about payment schemes for ecosystem services. I would just say there is also or are other dimensions as well. There's, for example, a socio-cultural dimensions. Forest owners are not only motivated by financial incentives, there's also other motivational arguments. How to create culturally robust payment schemes for ecosystem services is, in my view, um, an important question. How to deal with forest owners that are not interested in economics, but in other um, factors and so on. Um, a second point, um, this is a pure male panel and we are in the year 2022. Um, there is interesting research that shows how gendered perspectives on forest management, also on ecosystem services, enjoyment and so on. Are. So I would like to encourage us in the project also to become maybe a bit more sensitive uh, about being inclusive uh, also in panels like this. With that, I'm stealing your lunchtime, I'm afraid. Um, I'm at the end of my personal remarks. Thank you very much for these personal remarks, for this uh, wrap up of the session of today. Uh, that fits perfectly into what we have been hearing uh, all along. And as you said, uh, it's just us standing, uh, standing between uh, the participants and their lunch. Uh, we have so many things we could still discuss. And the discussion will continue, can continue. Uh, the, the materials of this uh, webinar will be published on the Sincere website and you will also be able to find other interesting documents. So please follow the two projects. Uh, the sad moment has come for me to say thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to the presenters, to the technical teams, to the teams that worked on the two projects, to all those of you who have participated today by sharing your experience in the chat on in questions and answers. And we are looking forward to working with you, uh, talking to you as soon as possible and wishing you a very, very nice afternoon. Thanking you for your assistance today. Good luck. Bye-bye.